You probably know that the Rhode Island House of Representatives uh, passed overwhelmingly 68 to 4 on Friday, this bloated $14 billion budget. I was surprised to see that number 68 to 4. Because that meant five, at least five Republicans voted for the legislation, and they did. And I'll show you those names in just a second. And then I was kind of surprised to see a, a media release come out from the House Leadership's office. Uh, you know, Mike Chippendale is the caucus leader. Basically defending why he and his other leadership people in the House GOP voted for this budget. I, I was surprised. Then I looked into it more, called a lot of people, talked, and apparently there was not much pushback on the floor of the House. Usually Republicans are standing up saying why they're not going to vote for this budget, blah, blah, blah. There was largely just silence. Apparently a deal had been struck between House leadership and uh, Speaker of the House, uh, House Republican leadership, the, the super min minority and the super majority uh, represented by Speaker Shikarchi. All right, we'll let you get a few things in. We'll let you push a few things out. But I don't. I want you and your team, or at least your leadership team, to vote for this budget, and I want you to be silent on the floor, largely silent. Don't want to hear any public opposition. Apparently, that's what happened. Now, that's politics, folks, all right? Do you understand there's nothing inherently evil about that? The question is, is it good politics? Is it going to help the Republican Party? Is it going to help our state? I don't know. Now, here, here's a look at who voted uh, for the bill of note. So every Democrat voted uh, for the budget, plus the uh, five Republicans in red. That's Leader Chippendale, uh, that's Sherry Roberts, that's David Place, that's Brian Newberry, and that's uh, Barbara Fenton Fung. Also of note, Charlene Lima, who we praised last week, voted for the bill. We praised her for pushing back against the budget bill, but she turned around and voted for it. Are uh, the Republicans who stood on their principle? And the question here is, do you stand on principle or do you do something practical? As I think Leader Chippendale is going to talk to us about in a minute. But those who stood on their principle were Representative Morgan, Representative Nordone, Representative Quattrochi, Representative Rea. Now, we've previously said Rhode Island, uh, excuse me, conservatives are nationally are a little bit sore right now after what happened in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, many of us believe that um, House Speaker uh, Kevin McCarthy caved and gave away whatever advantage he has. Now, the same qu this question here isn't whether or not House Republicans gave away any advantage they have because they have no advantage. They're a super. They have no advantage. They have no political cult. They have no leverage. Uh, getting a few yes votes isn't much leverage, but it's something. So the question is: Do you do you give the yes votes to get something? And, and, and cause all these questions to be asked, or or do you just continue to stand on principle as has been done in past years? But this budget in Rhode Island has exploded since the onset of COVID. Before COVID, I think we were under ten billion dollars. Now it's gone up almost forty over forty percent, and uh, it, it's uh, fourteen billion dollar fourteen billion dollars right now. There are some states with five times our population who only spend $14 billion in their state. New Hampshire, a Northeast state. Don't blame it on the high cost of living in the Northeast or the weather. New Hampshire has 1.4 million people and they spend basically the same amount in their budget. 40% more people, same budget. Massachusetts, you know, they've got, what, six, seven times the population, close to 7 million here. Uh, they only spend 8,000 person dollars per person. Rhode Island spends 12700 per person. That's more than 50% higher. It's almost 50% higher than what Massachusetts spend. Uh, we welcome back in the dugout uh, minority leader of the House Republican Caucus, Representative Mike Chippendale. Chip, welcome back in the dugout. How's it going, Stenhouse? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> hey, look, I got to admit that I, and I'm sure a lot of other people, a little surprised when they saw this media release come across, uh, I think it was on uh, Friday, uh, <laughs> that uh, you, and I highlighted in red, uh, something we'll talk about in a second, that you and many of your leadership team were supporting the monstrous $14 billion budget 
uh, that was passed by the House uh, last uh, Friday. And the Senate, of course, will will pass it this week. Uh, you, it's a pretty pretty detailed. Uh, I mean, I thought it was a good statement you made, but not a lot of people, at least from the conservative point of view, understand what was behind your thinking here. Floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, the release does uh, certainly highlight uh, the key points that we wanted to touch on. And um, absolutely, we, we've the Republicans have been voting against budgets for uh, all but one year for for the past 15 years. Um, and, and folks have come to expect that we will. So this year was definitely different and, and it was different for a lot of reasons. Um, obviously with, with a, um, a change of leadership in, in the caucus that sort of set the table for things to be uh, redefined. And um, I, I hadn't worked uh, very closely with the, the speaker on much um, prior to that. And I just took my approach to, to legislating and to uh, tackling policy issues to the speaker. Um, and he remained very open to, to the things that I was pushing for, the things that I was demanding. And we kept that dialogue going since February. Uh, I, I made it very clear what elements of the budget or just policy in general that I was opposed to. I made it very clear what uh, items I support and what items I, I wanted to see um, passing. So <clears throat> what you see is a result of those you know, roughly four months worth of back and right. forth. So you you say it right in the first line of your release, the quote, yep. the fiscal year 2024 budget process in the House was the different was different than previous years for the House Minority Caucus. So what you're saying here is that basically this approach is a new tactic by your uh, caucus to work with leadership as opposed to being the loyal opposition? Uh, no, I mean, we certainly have expressed our opposition on items that need, need to be opposed. And we made it very clear that this budget is not uh, identical to the budget that we would draft, of course. Um, but I think it's important for people to remember, not only are we not the only minority group in the house but we are the super minority okay my caucus represents 10 percent of the legislature now us voting no or yes on something does not change its trajectory in any way shape or form um the other group which is more threatening to the state of rhode island is the radical left and and they've created this progressive wing but they are very much at the table right now and have been since they they started to come into this building and now mike we are also at that table i can't stay on the sidelines and just throw bombs doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results which is voting no and pointing out all the flaws in the budget and expecting them to adopt them um it's not yeah. practical and it's not reasonable all right but I look at this budget, I see all kinds of progressive left wing elements in their sure. components in there. Maybe you modified a few of them or kept a few of them out, but I see a massive increase in government interference in our life. Uh, yes, I know you had some victories in there as well. So let's just frame the debate properly here. I'm not sure. going to make a judge, but let's frame the debate is, is it worth getting some, some concessions? Um, which which also means you're, you're voting for a massive increase, $14 billion in, in government spending, especially since before the pandemic. And then how does that relate when it comes to election time? Are, are, are you seen as the loyal opposition or that somebody wants to have confidence in you that you will fight for them? Or are you seen as something somebody who's just going to, uh, you know, I'm being overly dramatic here, lay down and comply with the leadership. So how do you square all those things? Because it's more than just what goes in the budget. You've got to you've got to think of elections and the perception to the public as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to that, I'd say this, Mike, you know, um, yeah, there are some things that the progressives wanted in that budget. If I was not part of this process, if I wasn't saying that cannot pass, this cannot be in there, this must be in there, this must pass, then how much worse would it be for us and how much better would it be for the progressives? And I'm here to tell you, it would be a lot better for them and it would be a lot worse for us. Now, we could, we could just say, we're going to sell that it. to voters, though. Can you sell uh, that to voters? I'm not worried about that until next September. September, Mike. Um, okay. th th that's the reality of it. I'm legislating right now. I'm not running for election. And that's the problem with this building. Too many people are running for re-election. 
and they use their time up on this floor to get things done that only further their um, electoral prospects. That's not what I'm doing. I was sent here by 14,000 people to do what's best for them. And if that means that I have to uh, compromise and strike a balance on, on one vote, the, one, the budget vote, um, then yeah, guilty as charged. I'm going to do the right thing to keep as many progressive ideas out of our budget. All right, so what, what, progressive ideas. what progressive ideas were, 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 do you think your efforts kept out of the budget? Certainly the biggest one, and this cannot be understated was getting eminent domain out of there for the housing issue. Um, we've had a lot of horrible housing initiatives passing this year. We have been unable to stop them. No one has been able to, to even slow them down. But on this issue, when, when the housing um, uh, secretary uh, came out and, and announced that they would be putting this initiative forward to, to just simply take people's property to do what they want, uh, we fought and we started right away and we fought hard. Um, that was a deal breaker. If that was in this budget, obviously we wouldn't be anywhere near it. So that I think is the biggest victory. Um, we would not uh, talk about any funding to Tidewater or Superman. Um, we wouldn't continue to support the idea of a federal lobbyist. These are things that very progressive ideas that they wanted in here that we were able to keep out simply by being at the table. 